Welcome to A Leader's Journey Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Gunn, and today I'm excited to have with me Daryl Lyons. Daryl, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So uh, first heard about you a number of years ago. We'll talk about that here in a second, but married four kids. Correct, yeah. Uh, got a couple of degrees, uh, the most recent one, uh, Master's in Law from A&M. Yeah, correct, yeah. yeah. Written a, four books. It was a COVID thing. A COVID thing, okay. Yeah. Had to be busy somehow, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I uh, author of four books. Uh, I don't know if we'll get to talk about the latest one uh, in this episode or maybe the next one, but uh, definitely uh, I got to hear you speak on that a couple of months ago. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, that was inter- some really interesting stuff. Uh, I was going to say, though, before uh, the when I first heard about you, you're co-founder of PAX and CEO, Correct. Uh, PAX Financial. I remember whew, this is a lot of years ago. Uh, driving through town and I saw your sign and that you were a Dave Ramsey yeah. endorsed local provider. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that guy must have his act together to, to be a Ramsey guy, you know? And, and, uh, and so I know you were for a number of years, uh, just before the show, you're saying, uh, you've gone a different direction, but, uh, mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about kind of how you got started. You were a young guy, got Ramsey's attention. Uh, yeah. I, and I can even go back just a little yeah. bit further if you don't mind, yeah, please. but, um, you know, I grew up in Castorville. Well, we moved around a bit, and I remember ed- edging um, our our trailer, our mobile home, on the side of the highway. And I remember uh, if you if you edge too close to the white skirting, you'll crack it. And I go, man, how do people have houses with foundations? Like that would be so cool. <laughs> and so the my friend, she, uh, her dad was a banker, and they had like this nice thick foundation. And I go, okay, I'll be a banker. So. I ended up going to St. Mary's and I got a job at a bank right there. It's at Bandera Woodlawn, primarily Spanish speaking um, community, loved him, became endeared to them, had dinner with them and uh, worked at a bank and then started to kind of understand kind of business and finance um, and got a degree in finance, got another one in accounting and graduated and, and found myself in, in this financial planning space. I'm making a, a, a long story short because it's important. I, I ended up getting a, um, a pretty good job and, and, you know, ups and downs, but ended up becoming partner of the year for a fortune 100 company and, um, was making pretty decent money. And my mom had told me about this Ramsey guy and I was like, he's, you know, he's sounds fun, but he's not, you know, I'm a certified financial planner. I'm a hot shot. He's for the other people. So then when I quit my job and I, uh, meet my wife, which we get, we get married, she quits her teaching job and we're broke, um, because I'm starting a new company. And um, our credit cards, our credit, this is embarrassing, our qu- credit cards were equal to our income. And uh, I didn't know how to unwind it. And uh, nothing in my certified financial planning curriculum or, nor my textbooks from undergrad could help this. But this Ramsey guy, it made sense. So we went through financial peace. We did the envelopes. Uh, we were disciplined with the envelopes for at least 12, 15 years. We've, we've tapered off since, but we were hardcore. Um, but it was, it was at a place of humility. And so, um, because I was into Ramsey, somebody came along and said, Hey, you're financial advisor. You like Ramsey and you authentically like Ramsey. That's very not, that's not common. Um, why don't you become endorsed by him? And so I was a little reluctant at first, but then raised my hand and man, he was such a blessing. He, he would send me and a couple guys at the the time, like leads every day. I was seeing seven or eight or nine people a day and just one after another and just volume, volume, volume. And so that was really the tailwind for PAX's growth um, between me uh, me and Joseph Schutze and Andres Gutierrez. I mean, we were just seeing a ton of people and they were good people with good hearts that just wanted some direction. And, and that was really how PAX hmm. got our lift. It was amazing. It was an amazing blessing. Yeah. 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 And, and now you have grown to a sizable financial organization. Um, you might share how many employees you have. It's- we have 25 employees and we're responsible for 700 million in assets. And, and we've got an insurance division, a 401k division. And um, we have ambitious growth goals, but at the same time, we're not taking any outside capital. So we're growing at what, what I consider a Jim Collins pace, pace. If you look at his research, just kind of that nice, steady growth that requires constraints. So you can think deeply about problems and solve them within reason, you know, some companies that just throw a bunch of money, they don't think deeply about how to solve problems. Mm-hmm. They just, you know, they just uh, fumble and, and go. And, and we just think deeply about problems because we've got capital constraints, which is good. And so um, our growth is ambitious, but we have a long time horizon to, to achieve those goals. 
Unpack that. Think deeply. Uh, our viewing audience tends to be leaders or business owners. Um, what is what does that mean to you? What's your experience been with that? How do you do it? Uh, I mean, it's everything. It's um, you know putting yourself in the client shoes and asking you know what are their expectations, um, and and obviously that's probably one of the bigger points of view to consider. But it, it really is a challenging one to consider because it's not only client expectations, but we've got demographic changes that are taking place today where the consumers of our products and services and many people out there are moving and transitioning from this baby boomer generation who had a different set of expectations, you know, the hard work, you know, earn your keep kind of thing to, um, you know, Gen X and even the millennials and this transition of money taking place. So just trying to understand the expectations of one group as they transition to another and then um, integrate it in such a, 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 a way that the technology supports this uh, change. And so you've got these multifaceted factors that are taking place in the marketplace where you're trying to keep up with technology changes and then also meeting client expectations. The challenge might be for some people would be, oh, hey, I found this new tech tool. Let me just adopt it and then figure out how it maps over to client expectations. But it really comes down to saying, first, what problem am I trying to solve? And then identifying the technology that can solve that problem. But here's the kicker. It's not just there. It's then saying, how do I effectively implement this technology, which has another set of challenges on its own, because if you've got multiple employees, you've got to then figure out how to adopt this technology with different skill sets. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to say, but does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's talk about about implementing technology, AI has been in the news a lot for this last 12 months. Yeah, um, You've obviously seen a few different technology waves in the last couple of decades as, as you've been on the forefront, I would imagine, of technology being in, in the financial industry. Uh, what, what, any secret sauce on how to get people to uh, accept change? your employees in particular or your customers any any lessons learned there um i probably bribe people <laughs> um the, so i do you know i you know if i have technology i would often have it's not uncommon for me to have like incentives or contests to try to get people because i why i mean why if it's working you know i don't want to change so i try to give incentives and encourage and just the old school rally kind of hey and i'll give you a gift card whoever gets we had a new for example we had a new um which i was really excited about a new artificial intelligence tax planning tool, which was very cool. Um, it didn't require a lot of, um, um, uh, I guess, mechanical stuff, you know, human labor, but it did require some, you know, the advisor had to go get a tax return and upload it to a portal and then, and then understand how that works and, you know, the outputs. So, you know, an advisor's got a lot going on. And so the advisor's you know, like, well, you know, I got a lot to mess with it. I don't want to do this new tax planning tool. Okay, fine. Here's how we're going to do it. I got to make this fun and I've got to make it somehow. I've got to get them to adopt 10 of them because I know once I get 10 and they realize it's easy and the value, then I'm good. So yeah, I'll, I'll get a contest going and then pay them money. And then, and then once we get on the other side of that learning curve, then I know it'll take off. Mm -hmm. But that learning curve is just a tough one. You got to be, I don't know, fun and creative to mm -hmm. get through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And have you used that tactic on, on several yeah. occasions? Yeah. Yeah. That's one I hadn't heard of before, so I'm, uh, I'm kind of curious. Unfortunately, so. I probably use it with my kids, too. And so <laughs> I don't know. That might have some long-term ramifications. <laughs> as long as they like cash. I, yeah. I personally am a fan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, let, since we're on the technology track for a second, let's stay there. What... what um, what are you excited about where technology is going or what concerns do you have or, or both? Well, I mean, you know, you're going to just see, you know, some j job misplacements for people who don't have skills. And so I think you're going to have a marketplace that um, there's going to people are going to pay a premium for um, services and people that have the ability to um, discern that have empathy and they could use good judgment because the information is no longer, I mean, this happened years ago, but it's happening more prevalent now. I mean, in the early nineties, um, even before that, I guess maybe 98, 99, um, the information was held by the, by the people, by the institutions. Then the internet came and then the information is now held by the consumer. I mean, everyone has the information. So, you know, like for example, in our industry, 
we, we, you know, our roots are in being a stockbroker. We had the information. We could tell you if Exxon Mobil was going to go up or down, and then you would, you, you would hire us to, to sell you that stock. Well, that's no longer the case anymore. Somebody can go online and see if Exxon Mobil is going to go up and down. So now that the information's changed hands, and even more so, um, it requires people are going to be hiring people to discern that information. And so how do you know uh, who to use? Like who uses good judgment? Like who out there has good judgment? I, you know, and this happens in medicine too. So, you know, you, you have something wrong with your stomach and you can look up on Google all the problems, but who do I know out there that has the ability to use good judgment and help me through this? Mm -hmm. And so that skill set's a completely different skill set and it's really, really rooted in trust. Mm. And so, you know, then you scratch your head and go, okay, I need somebody who understands this, but also aligns with my values because there's a lot of noise. And I don't, I really don't want somebody that doesn't understand my values giving me advice. Mm. So I think that's a great opportunity in the marketplace to really think deeply about um, how we serve, how we can elevate our decision making, um, because there are some, there's a lot of science behind decision making. How can we become better at decision making? And then, and then making sure that we serve people that have that value alignment. So it's a great opportunity, but if you're just in the business of providing information, you might look for another job. But mm. if you're in the business of using judgment and people are hiring you for that judgment, I think you, you'll thrive. Have you, have you found any ways or books or tools to help your team exercise better judgment or be better at solving problems or whatever? Yeah, um, I mean, it's an ongoing conversation that we have. Um, I give credit to, um, we just, I moved into the CEO role and then we have Janice Brooks who has worked alongside of me. She's now president and she spends a lot of time thinking deeply about how to help our employees make uh, better judgment calls. Mm -hmm. Um, some of it is also rooted in just using some of the, um, personality profile tools that we have, just knowing yourself better and what deficiencies you have, whether that's the Enneagram in some cases or the disc profile and all of those. And so, you know, having this self-awareness is really important. And then of course it goes to, um, Larry Bosity has a great framework framework for this. Um, the former CEO of Honeywell, you know, it's, it's just, you know, the self-awareness, authenticity and and self-mastery and so that that progression of just knowing who you are what you're not good at and then redefining those skills and some of it is socratic questioning too so we've integrated some of those tools and how to how to ask good questions mm -hmm. but it really is and, and we talked a little bit about bef before this behavioral finance mm -hmm. so i'll kind of get into that for just a second yeah. so behavioral finance is this area of study that we've adopted quite a bit and it's um, this collision of neuroscience, psychology, and traditional finance into one area of study. And it does require a skill set of being able to understand people in a different way. And then also understand the biases that are out in the marketplace. Just simple bias as, um, you know, if, if an airplane crashes, then you know people are going to not want to fly in airplanes. Well, the probabilities of a plane crashing just went down exponentially because of heightened awareness. But these types of biases, you got to work through those. And just having the skill set to be able to work through that just requires an ongoing assessment of who you are individually and just refining and refining and refining. And sometimes we actually do role playing to help refine okay. that. Yeah. I was going to ask about was there something, some sort of training or role playing? Um, so with Socratic questioning, that actually takes a a bit of uh, role playing or training. Yeah. It doesn't just happen naturally. No. Uh, is, that's an example you gave. Are there any are there any kind of standard staple of things that you found work well to help your employees embrace some of these concepts? Um, yeah, I would say um, one one of the things that we do it's it's not anything um, earth shattering, but we do book reports every month, okay. and so that's kind of fun. That's engaging. Um, we've been doing that for years, where every um, Every month we get together in a room and we cover a topic that may be salient. Last one we did was crucial conversations mm -hmm. and just unpacking that. Um, so could I have AI give me a summary of that so I can show up and be conversational? I or you can even do it for read it, read it for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> read it for me. and can do that for Steve's, you. Steve's got to appreciate the shout out there. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so there, there's a lot of things that we do to just, be, you know, improve um, people's skill sets, but some of it honestly goes into the coaching space because we can teach people things, uh, and our employees. And I've, this is a challenge for me because I've had employees leave and I will say, you know, 
are they better off? I, I, sometimes I wonder, are they better off or did I just waste my time teaching them things that they never applied? Mm. And they were just kind of going through the motions because mm. they were picking up a paycheck. So one of the things that we try to do is try to encourage people to set their own goals and then try to hold them accountable to their goals. And often find, oftentimes we'll find that they're um, adopting personal goals that are piggybacking on some of the training that we've mm. um, encouraged them. So, so that's the key is not just giving them the information, but having employees take ownership and adopting it in their own blank space, mm -hmm. which is really – you know, ultimately really valuable for me because then I would play a role in making that person a better man, a better father, a better husband, better wife. So you, you're, you're a fun person to have on the podcast because you and your partners started the business from scratch. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, as you said, your, your credit card payments were equal to your income personally. Yeah. yeah. You know, so you're, you're literally experiencing the paycheck to paycheck thing and kind of, yeah you know, the discipline that following the Ramsey envelope system takes. Mm -hmm. But now you, you lead a team of dozens of employees. You're, you're in a more senior role. You've had to mature yourself, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. what, were some of the, what were some of the hardest things to let go? Maybe you still wrestle with them today. For some people, it's delegation. For some people, it's, um, you know, whatever. What, what were some of those for you as you I think it's made the hurdles? Yeah, I think, you know, there's been some small ones along the way, but a, a big one is contentment, you know. Um, you know, when, when in, in the old Testament talks, you know, the, when we look at the commandments, thou shalt not covet is one that I kind of just look over, but that one's hit me harder because, um, you know, I have ambition and I often have to understand what's the difference between selfish ambition and what's the Lord's. And, and so there's been many times, many, many times where I look at somebody and go, man, I should be there. Or I, I should have done that. I, I could be bigger. I could, you know, and, and the Lord has really done a good work on me there where you just being content mm. and not trying to just appreciating the person that's in front of me. Um, and slowing down and people that have known me for years know that I wouldn't slow down. I just go at a very fast pace and had a lot of ambition and it is maturity that, that helps me just realize I'm just really content. Um, but at the same time, I'm not complacent by any means, but I think that one thing alone has been so special of a gift that God's given mm -hmm. me just to be content mm -hmm. and just enjoy where I'm at and just appreciate where I'm at. And, and then here's, here's a kicker for me because I'll go to conferences and I'll see people that are my peers on stage and, and, and in my, maybe a few years ago, I'd be like, man, I, I should be up there. But now because God's done a good work and this is authentic and sincere. I'll say, man, I'm so gl glad that God gave him gifts to do that. That's such a blessing. And I hope he uses it for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So it's really been a good thing for me. And that's been one of the greater ones lately that now, but there's been a hundred more different skill sets that he's refined over the years, but that's been the latest mm -hmm. one. That's interesting. So, so what would, um, how would, how would younger Daryl react if older Daryl walked up and said, Hey, about 20 years from now, contentment, it's really going to be important to you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would have said that was weakness. <laughs> <laughs> I said that that's a cop out for somebody who doesn't know how to make it make it happen. You know, yeah, yeah. I had my my attitude in life was mental toughness, extra effort. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just anchored to a scripture. Go, that, go, go, and thou slugger consider his ways and be wise. Right. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. um, I just didn't have this idea of complacency. I thought it was weak. And um, now I'm appreciating it for mm -hmm. what it's worth and, and where God has me. The reason I ask that question is, is I've. In the last year or two, I've wondered, what if Joel today went and talked to Joel 20 or 30 years ago? And that Joel would have been like, yeah, that's nice, old, old guy. I hear you. That's but cute. You, yeah. That's cute. That's yeah, cute. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. You know, and because uh, I, I was a workaholic and I loved every minute of it. I know. You know. And for me to now as a CEO coach to say, hey, you need to throttle it back and have some decent. You know, back here, I'm a hypocrite. You know, you're the guy that was working the 100 hour week. So now you're advising not to, you know, it's unbelievable. Yeah, that would have been good. I would also told me to I would have said, you know, relax more. Um, yeah, I, I got into martial arts because I just I didn't have an I, I had more in me and I couldn't I like couldn't let it. There was a lot I wanted to do. And but I would have I would have I would go back and I'd say, um, be content. And I would also tell my younger self, worry less because mm. it was this whole 
mix of stuff that, you know, I was just worried. Mm -hmm. I was worried I'm going to have to go back to the trailer. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, but God's, God's done a good work there too. You've, uh, you've mentioned your relationship with God and your faith uh, already in the, in the podcast. How does, how's that been received by your customers? Like, do you just keep a wall up and you don't talk about your faith or are you able to express your faith and how do they receive that? What's your experience been? So, um, make a short story long. Yes, please. Just, uh, <laughs> this is a podcast. So yeah, that's okay. what we're here for. So, um, it was several years ago, we did a video production on YouTube and it was the giving challenge. I don't know if you ever saw that, but we, we gave money to the employees for them to go, turn around and give it to the community mm -hmm. nonprofits. Mm -hmm. We filmed it. It was well received. I gave God the glory. Um, cause that's just what I, there wasn't anything I thought about. I just did it. Had a client come up to me and said, Hey, that was a great that y'all gave to the community, but it was a little religious. I said, Oh, hmm. it's a good point. So we did another next year. We did another one. Maybe it was two years later. I was like, okay, this time I remember she said that. So I'm going to go ahead and leave God out of it. And we did it just kind of secular. I didn't want to offend anyone. And we produced it and I watched that go, really? And, and I, you know, there's so many scriptures that, I mean, I just, it was just kind of embarrassing that I did that, the idea of being lukewarm. And it was at that point I go, you know, the reality is, is that I have a harder time personally of being a, a believer here and a not believer at work. And it's, and that, that's really hard for me. That almost feels like hypocrisy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was at that point I said, you know, I, I remember an old saying that, you know, if you're pleasing everyone, you're lying somewhere. And so I thought, you know, I've That's got a, I've got a choice to make here, kind of an inflection point. This is a pretty recognized client in the community that had some influence. And I'll have, I have to have a choice of which direction I'm going to go. Cause eventually if I kind of lean into my faith and, and express it auth authentically throughout my business, I am going to lose this client and their influence. And I, I've got to reconcile that. And, um, of course that was okay. So I made that decision and it's been wonderful because it's been freeing. Mm -hmm. It's been really freeing to not have to try to be two different people. And so, um, the way I approach it is I'm very respectful. And the reason I'm respectful when I communicate with people from all walks of life is because I really don't know their unique life story. Like, I really don't know where they came from or where they're at. And so um, I think the way I express my faith is just one of my own personal testimony. And I, um, I you know, I encourage where I think it's appropriate. But I, I do my best not to um, be overwhelming. I did it once. I thought this guy, he was a big client again. Again, I made a lot of mistakes. Very big client. Had a good relationship with him and uh, asked him to go to lunch. I had worked through some very personal life issues with him. So I felt we had a deep rapport. We go to lunch, subject of God comes up. I knew he was an atheist, so mm -hmm. subject of God comes up and I just share. I'm like, man, I just want to tell you about Jesus. And uh, the next day fired me. I was like, okay, I'll do it again. Doesn't matter. I'll do it again. <laughs> um, and, and, and so I accept the, I accept that there's going to be some consequences of living out my faith, but I, I, I think living in a, in a space of being disingenuous is not a space I want to, I want to live in. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's just respecting everyone's unique life story and then living in authenticity. You're a numbers guy. Uh, one of the things that, that, uh, seems to scare or concern business people is I'm going to alienate large numbers of my customers or my employees or whatever. I don't get that sense from you that you lost 10 or 20% of your clients no. expressing your faith. Do you, do you, can you characterize, has it been a big thing? Two or three customers out of yeah, 10,000? Yeah, I mean, what are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, we're talking like three out of, you know, 1,500. Nice. Okay. So no, it's not been an issue at all. Good. And, um, and uh, so it's not, you know, not a concern. Um, the, the other thing I was really, I was really concerned with and I, you know, by now, you know, I overthink things. So one of the things I was concerned with was I just thought I, you know, when you talk about using the Lord's name in vain, just kind of going back to the 10 commandments, 
um, I think about not just using GD in a movie, a, a Titanic or something, but actually using his name for my own profit. Mm. I think about that being the Lord's mm -hmm. name in vain. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to use God's name and I'm just going to make a lot of money or I'm going to be a politician and, and get elected. Like that's using the Lord's name in vain. Good point. So for me, I didn't want to use the Lord's name in vain. So that uh, was another sticking point where I had to say, okay, I got to check my heart here and make sure it's not uh, this, uh, this idea of living out my faith in an authentic way isn't rooted in any way of me being more successful. Some sort of gain. Yeah. And so I got to a place where I could, you know, authentically say, nope, that's not, that's not my agenda. People can actually think it might be, but I don't care. I know my heart mm -hmm. and I know that's not my agenda. And so what's been interesting though, is we've attracted more people that are saying, you know what, I want to work with somebody like that, that has those values. Mm -hmm. And, and is that, does that have any influence on your last book? Yeah, exactly. Your, yeah. Most recent book, I should say. Very much so. Yeah, hopefully it's not your last. <laughs> no, I've got a couple more in me. I don't. Yeah, I do. I enjoy writing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would I'd like to go there, um, but it feels like a good place just to kind of wrap up this particular episode. We're going to going to have you back. Yeah. Um, and so any any thoughts just to put a bow around this this part? No, it's all good. You know, I, I appreciate you asking those questions and um Certainly, it's been a, a, a wonderful experience just living out my faith in such a way that I don't feel like I'm two different people. Mm. And so the way you ask those questions really allowed me to explain it. That yeah, way. No, that's, yeah. And I think that's important. What, you know, if you're an atheist, be a great atheist. Like, you know, yeah. be sold out to your atheism. Yeah. If you're a Christian, be a Christian. Be sold yeah. out to your, yeah. your Christianity. Exactly. So, all right. Well, thank you, sir. It's been, been a pleasure so far. And, and, and we'll continue the conversation. You got it. Thanks.